Okay, today what I'm going to begin with are a few remaining points in this discussion that I wanted to touch upon. Uh, before <coughs> reflecting on it in general and making use of the line of discussion to think about it in particular regard to the relationship between the economy and the state. And now I want us to move to look at the lines account of Marxist economics uh, and its approach, its general approach to thinking about the market economy and its character and how it relates to, to politics. We will be looking at Marx in his own right later on, and I think we'll see that to some degree there are aspects of his theory that lead in other directions than those taken uh, by Marxist economics, but there is such a thing as Marxist economics, which, of course, relies upon factors that are centrally represented in what Marx is. But I want to look at that as a kind of existing theoretical approach that has many adherents in various varieties, just as classical political economy, uh, many of his class exponents in Smith, but it has its other representatives. And I want us, with the help of, of a line, to get some sense of what have been the principal approaches in the discipline of economics that has arisen with the advent of the economy. And by that I mean classical political economy, Marxist economics, neoclassical economics, and Keynesian economics. Now, in the beginning, we have more or less surveyed much of the general framework in which Smith depicts uh, the market system that arises with a very specific type of division of labor, reflecting a very specific kind of market situation. And I just want to draw your attention to <clears throat> thinking about the nature of the transition from the initial form of the division of labor that Smith points to, and then the form that, if not entirely supplanting the former, comes to more and more <clears throat> largely dominate society and the economy and relations between the economy and other institutions, be they the family or state. And remember that the first form of the division of labor that he depicts is one of basically individual producers who have specialized um, employing the skills that they themselves wield, making use of resources, of instruments of production that they themselves own, and on this basis, produce for a market of other similarly specialized producers. Now, in a sense, all of the participants in this division of labor and this type of market are, in a sense, motivated to produce what they can to meet the effectual demand that others have for the part of the product that they will not themselves consume. And with the, the money that they receive in return, purchase products produced by others who will meet their other needs. So in a certain sense, the, the, the nature of this type of production is that individuals are going to be coming up with commodities that they will market. They will sell them to others. And with the proceeds that they receive, they will then uh, buy or purchase the commodities that they need. And essentially, this will allow them to reproduce themselves and potentially the families that depend upon, the family members who depend upon their, their livelihood. And you can see that this essential relationship might appear to involve nothing that would uh, require either an expansion of wealth beyond what 
is necessary to meet the respective needs of the individual producers. Each of them, in a sense, will be entering the market according to that type of formula that is highlighted by Marx in distinguishing the kind of formula that depicts what is specific to a different kind of market situation dominated by wage labor and owners of capital. And here with the individual producers who produce products which they market, which they own, there is a circulation of commodities. It follows the formula where you can speak of someone advancing a commodity, thought of in terms of the letter C, which is then exchanged for money by being sold. And then that money, N, is exchanged for further commodities, different commodities. And this very same exchange pattern is engaged in by every other participant in the market because they're doing the same thing. They're all putting up for sale something they produce based upon their own resources. And they do so in order to basically receive the money that will give them the effectual demand sufficient to purchase from others the commodities that they need. Now you might ask yourself, what kind of competition enters into this situation? Because obviously, like any market situation, individuals are offering something in exchange and they can't compel anyone to take it. They have to get others to agree to take it in return for what they want. Of course, if you have money as a commodity, then other individuals have obtained money in exchange for what they provide. This is something that, in a sense, could be put to use by everyone. So as long as individuals have effectual demand in the sense of money, they have something that can be exchanged with any other player in the marketplace who can use that to purchase what they need. Now you might ask again, in what sense is there a field for competition and what would be the consequences of the competition? In what respect might one say there is a field for the workers of competition, given precisely that there is no guarantee that what an individual brings to market will be purchased by others? Although the framework in question is one that can only sustain itself if the individuals involved do succeed. If they don't succeed, then they can't enter the market, continue to be a player in the market, nor will they be able to sustain themselves if they are in a situation where the market presupposes, and the division of labor presupposes, that no other social relationship is mandating what they do, nor providing them with what they need. And by the way, if you think about that with regard to the household, what does it signify? What would be true of the household in order for individuals to be in this kind of division of labor, this most rudimentary division of labor? What would have to be true of the family? We can say in a very negative way. Well, it does not involve the kind of relationship that Aristotle speaks of. That is, the relationship that would go beyond having sex to reproduce and bringing up children, at least in terms of offering the kind of care you can provide. But what would be absent are those activities that take place within the oikos to provide for the daily recurring needs of the members of the household. Now, here we're dealing with a family that doesn't have that going on, which is why individuals have to specialize and engage in a market and be part of a market. And they're part of a market precisely because the family is no longer that which can provide them for their livelihood. But by the same token, you want to think about what this means for the state in a very rudimentary way. The state is not going to be making demands upon the activities of individuals. It's not going to require that they do certain activities. They're not going to be building the pyramids as slave labor. Nor are they going to be building roads as corvée laborer. 
as in the absence of state law, the Supreme Court didn't put us to theorize about it. Instead, the state will operate in such a way that instead of demanding services directly or equally providing individuals with goods, it will itself do everything in a way that allows the state to operate on the basis of market relationships. Now, of course, what is the basic way in which the state will obtain the resources it needs if it is not going to directly operate in a manner that circumvents the market? Well, it would impose taxes, right? It would engage in taxation. Instead of demanding anything particular from individuals, any particular service or any particular goods, it will let individuals, in a sense, choose what to offer up, how to provide the money they have to pay. And in return, the state will then have to, you could say, purchase the services and goods that it needs in order to conduct its affairs. And in that way, we have a kind of government that can operate in such a manner that the market will continue to be that focal point in which individuals will find themselves occupied and find their needs performed. So that, for example, if you work for the state, you're going to, in a sense, be paid for it, even if you're a soldier. A volunteer army and the like. From all due respect, we have a kind of state that will confine itself in such a way that it will operate in concert with this kind of activity. Now, if you think about the kind of competition that would operate if we think of this near situation, this minimal situation of individuals who are producing goods that they bring to market, the typical kind of pressures that Smith focuses upon have relatively little room to operate. Because it's not as if the, I mean, what is it that the individuals in question lack that becomes a focal point of the way in which, the way in which competition will work itself out when we move beyond this situation? One in which the market becomes dominated by division of labor that occurs within enterprises where there is an owner of the enterprise, a private enterprise, employing wage laborers. Well, remember, the private producers have very limited resources. They have only the resources to produce what they bring to the market. They're not in a position to invest in new lines of manufacture, for example. They're not in a position to transplant themselves from place to place and bear the cost of all of that. They're not in a position to, in a sense, continually revolutionize their own production process and increase the productivity of what they're engaged in and the like. They have their own limited skills, for that matter. It's not as if they have a choice of who they will employ. They're stuck with me or whoever it is. But you can see the situation is very different when we have the second form that takes place, which, as Smith points out, arises when certain factors have come into play. And it's interesting to think about what's the relationship between the emergence of these factors as a fine new situation. And it's really the situation that the argument of the wealth of nations is primarily concerned with. How does that new situation arise? Does it arise simply from the workings of the initial division of labor? Or does it fall from something else? Now, we know that the single things that bring about the new situation are, on the one hand, the private appropriation of land in general, which then makes rent a factor that now enters into the determination of price. And then there's something else, which is somehow or other the accumulation of a capital stock sufficient not just to tie an individual 
over the time between when they actually get to work and then produce a product and then succeed in selling it. Now, now we're talking about the capital stock that can be used to provide for the production apparatus that can then employ a multiplicity of wage laborers in a very specialized you know, factory system in the like. It's not clear that there's any particular link that's laid out of how the mere workings of the initial market of individual producers leads to the other situation. And Smith does not specifically speak about it. But I would suggest that you know, it obviously involves something happening to the land, something that will put it under private ownership. And it's not clear that that is something that can be done by an economic process by a process that's relying simply on initial division of labor. Likewise, there's also somehow the accumulation in some hands of the kind of wealth, of the kind of capital that allows for the establishment of private enterprises that will be employing wage labor. Wage labor. Now, if you think about this new situation, however it arises, it seems to have something about it that is extraneous in character to the workings of the initial division of labor and market. And I think it's important because, in a way, it brings to mind another basic feature to the whole workings of the self-regulating market. Namely, the self-regulating market begins on the basis of a distribution of property, be it property of land or of capital, without which it can't operate in a manner that will allow for the specific forms of self-regulation that Smith is depicting. And that is important because, in a certain sense, it very much conditions the roles that individuals play. Whereas you might think that in the initial division of labor, you could simply choose what you're going to produce. Perhaps, if you could somehow develop the skill and find what is needed to produce particular products. But here we're dealing with a situation where you can't simply choose to open an enterprise that is going to be employing a plurality of individuals unless you have sufficient capital. Nor will you be owning property and being able to operate as a landlord unless somehow you have the property in question. We have roles that, in a sense, one can engage in and act in, but it depends upon already having a certain kind of specific resources, which has implications for then, of course, what happens in the marketplace. Now, we've seen that Smith points out that in a more developed, more civilized, more wealthy nation, the division of labor gets intensified, the market increases in extent, insofar in particular as it embraces this new form of the division of labor involving private enterprise. And Smith suggests this is going to be something that not only will tend to increase its share of the market, but it will itself increase its own magnitude. It will expand its production. It will expand its wealth. And the question is, why will that occur? Why will that occur? Why, first of all, will this form of economic enterprise push aside or more and more diminish, in at least major areas, the other kind of division of independent producers? Why will that occur? Now, Smith, by the way, I mean, he does point to certain areas where there are limitations to the growth of this kind of private enterprise. Where's one area? Where it may be hard to have the kind of division of labor that a private enterprise allows for, employing a multitude of wage laborers under a single economic unit. He points to agriculture as presenting certain obstacles. And what are the obstacles that he points to? 
agriculture happened. It makes it difficult to keep, in a sense, in standing employed, individuals will be engaged in different kinds of work under a single enterprise. No, it's very seasonal. Right? It's, it's hard to keep that workforce in place. Right? So in a sense, it, it might tend to make for the extent of this kind of uh, economic development of an internal division of labor more difficult. Simply because you have to deal with the fact that it's hard to keep that differentiated workforce in play throughout the year. Is there any other kind of enterprise or work that would be difficult to um, transform in the way in which pin manufacturing can be transformed through private enterprise? A kind of, en a kind of enterprise that, in a sense, could retain the form of the, shall we say, the private producer, the individual who brings what they have to bring to market, and in a way can continue to do so without being bypassed. And when we speak about bypassing the individual producer, what will, in a sense, push the private producer out of the way and allow for private enterprise to become dominant? Well, precisely the kind of things that, that, uh, that Smith speaks of, first of all, with regard to the internal division of labor and the ability for it to produce with much greater productivity objects that an individual craftsman will have much greater difficulty in producing. First of all, with respect to quantity. So what will that mean with regard to the possibility of the individual producer for maintaining their, their livelihood doing what they're doing? <clears throat> What competitive pressures will they face? That will, in effect, make it impossible for them to function. Well, these goods can now be produced with much greater productivity, meaning, with, in a sense, much less expenditure of labor per item. So the prices can tumble, but the individual producer cannot afford to sell the pin they spend all day working to produce at the price that a factory can produce on 100,000 a day, 150 workers or whatever. Right? And by the same token, think of the resources that the private enterprise has, the flexibility it has, it can change its workforce to face the comings and goings of effectual demand. It has a greater capital that it can transfer to set up new enterprises. Think of the barriers to setting up an enterprise given the magnitude of capital you need. As an individual producer here, we're sorely limited all of this. So in all these respects, you can understand it, the severe competitive advantage of private enterprise employing wage laborers would allow it to be dominant. Now, the area I was referring to, the kind of area where there could be a resistance to private enterprise employing wage laborers would be situations where the product in question is not something that easily susceptible to being produced by a division of labor within an enterprise. For example. Well, I mean, still, it's not clear that that could not be. I mean, the land itself might have a special um, uh, superiority for producing something. But that doesn't mean there could be a private enterprise that has wine with it. And however, it could maintain a higher price. I'm speaking about productions by an individual producer who markets what they have to offer and what would allow them to remain in business, so to speak. Because the nature of what they're doing is not susceptible to the kind of, <coughs> well, an undertaking in the form of a private enterprise in the form of plurality of wage laborers. Certainly, things like quality, but our solid just for the sake of the name. Well, question, why, why would the fact that something you know, that might have a certain panache can't be produced by a private enterprise? But what I was going to say art. Maybe art. 
I mean, we're talking about an artwork that, that requires something unique to be an individual artist. But also services by you know, so-called professionals, lawyers, doctors, and things. But we're doing a service that involves a certain kind of expertise that is not something that can be divided up in the way in which the production of a certain product can be. You know, these things can resist the kind of pressures to some degree. But otherwise, you can see how the dynamic of the nature of this organization is going to push in the direction of a, of a different kind of market, a different kind of division of labor, provided accumulations of capital are available, provided the land on private property and the like. On that basis, in a sense, an economic system now becomes set free with the possibilities of revolutionizing the production process to meet the demands of competition. Now, by the way, you might ask, and this is not something that, let's say, Smith brings out explicitly, but you might ask, first of all, what is it that is going to allow for production and economic activity to expand, for wealth to accumulate, for the wealth of a nation to increase on the basis of this private enterprise system? The client's very own dynamic will supplant the division of labor of private producers and individual producers. And remember, to some extent, the whole process of competition might seem to be one where all that's at stake is movements in entry and exiting from different types of enterprise that are basically always going to allow, in a sense, what is brought to market to be purchased, and for all effectual demand to, in a sense, succeed in purchasing what it aims for. None of this, in the abstract, seems to generate any expansion in economic activity. But how might one see the seeds of expansion? I mean, first of all, where is there room for expansion? I mean, for expansion in general, what has to occur? If you think about the enterprise, remember, all the revenues of the enterprise come from the sale of its products. They're parts of the prices of commodities. All revenues, in a sense, derive from the prices at which products are sold. Where do we find the element of price formation? And one could say revenue. A place where there is somehow a room for economic expansion. To what? Well, demand for what? And for what product? What level of production? What I'm asking is what, in this situation, will allow for the level of production to increase? Well, I mean, the labor may be there, but there has to be, of course, perhaps an increase in supply of labor if what is true. If you bring in more revenue than you... Well, but also if you can't increase productivity of a given supply of labor. Because you can have economic expansion without increasing labor force if you increase the productivity of that labor force. But you need to have increasing investment, right? Investment in, shall we say, generally speaking, the means of production, which would involve both more machinery, more materials, more labor to produce more. Now, of course, in spending all of that, you're also adding to the amount of revenue, right? Because those who you purchase these inputs for added investment are going to be receiving added revenue. Which might expand demand. Of course, the supply is going to increase as well. Well, all of this is going to take place in one particular sector of the price. What part of the price is going to be key? Profit. What? Profit. Profit, right. Because profit, on the one hand, may be put forward by Smith, as he says, you know, towards the end of our selections. He points out at one point that, as on page 267, he writes, to maintain and augment the stock. He says the sole end and purpose of both fixed and circulating capital is to maintain and augment the stock, which may be reserved for immediate consumption. 
which would seem to suggest that, in a sense, the whole aim of the way of putting forward capital is to provide for the personal consumption of the individual to <coughs> participate in the market economy uh, in their respective roles as wage laborer, landlord, uh, wagerer of capital. But if that's the case, there would not be any additional investment, right? Because somehow the additional investment will have to come out of the profit, and the profit in question will not be kept either in the form of money, let alone spent on just matters of personal consumption, but would have to be invested in the means for standard production. Now you may remember that in a way, one way of thinking about the way the, the division of labor and the market as a whole operates is in terms of thinking of how the structure of enterprises and the factors that go into production in a sense dictate what has to be produced and what revenues are needed in order to purchase sufficient inputs to produce the outputs that will themselves generate both inputs for a further round of consumption and production, uh, as well as the revenues that allow these, these items to be bought and sold. It might appear, in other words, that uh, the conditions for the reproduction of the ongoing process have a lock on everything that is occurring. And we have basically a simple reproduction of what's going on. But there is another element that comes up when we're dealing with the profit. And this has to do with how the presence of the profit allows for a certain kind of, well, call it lack of determination regarding, well, uh, in a sense, what will follow from the operation of economic activity. And this has to do with, in a sense, what happens to the profit and how it relates to other streams of revenue. And Smith um, brings this up in his discussion of the wages of labor. Now, to begin with, earlier on, you know, he speaks of the wages of labor as, as being more the value of labor, the natural price for labor. In what terms? <coughs> in what terms does he speak about, in a sense, what would be the natural price of the wage? He speaks of it more or less in terms of uh, the value of those goods that, in a sense, are required for the laborer to be reproduced. Now, strictly speaking, he recognizes that this is not simply a matter of providing for the survival needs of the individual laborer. What more does it involve? Because we're thinking of it, again, in terms of subsistence here. But even in terms of subsistence, that is what is required in order to allow the laborer to subsist and thereby be able to re-enter the economic process as a wage laborer. But what, uh, what more than the laborer's individual subsistence has to be taken into account? And especially in the global sense that we're thinking about uh, the ability of, let's say, private enterprise to continue to operate. No, the family, basically. I mean, if, if the family now has to rely upon the livelihood of a wage laborer, well, if, if there's a single wage laborer uh, supporting the family, then the wages have to be sufficient to support the family. Now, of course, uh, Smith seems to suggest that we're dealing with one adult in the family working as a laborer. Particular demand for women dealing with domestic duty, but there's nothing in principle about the market that it requires, obviously, that be the case. There's no reason why all adults as well as all children can be working in the market, as they <coughs> certainly were in Smith's time, uh, innumerable hours during the day. 
But in any event, to the extent that the individual has needs that deal with a family or with even the reproduction of the population of the working class, there's something more to be involved here. But Smith, now in discussing the wage, indicates there's another side to it. If you think in terms of the process of production as an ongoing process, with the division of labor and the market that is tied to it, is going to continue operating, then the various factors that enter into it have to be sustained, have to receive what they need to continue an operation that applies to labor itself. And so there's, in some respect, a sense in which subsistence has a determining role to play in terms of what wages must be. And indeed, Smith points out, there is at least a minimum threshold of what wages have to be if these economic operations are going to continue. But on the other hand, there's also a contract. There's an agreement made between the wage laborer and the employer. And this transaction is one in which, as Smith points out, there are two very opposing interests. What are the opposing interests? The laborer tries to earn as much as he can, while the employer tries to pay as little as he can. And how does this relate to revenues and, in a sense, the impact of this, in a way, on, in a sense, aspects concerning the operation of the enterprise? Well, it might appear, on the face of it, that it's a kind of zero-sum game. You have the prices at which goods can be sold, given the conditions of the market, where the movement of capital, in a sense, is going to be pushing all enterprises to more or less find themselves having to submit to a kind of average rate of return. But within that, and the price that that involves, if wages are increased, this will diminish the profit. And in a certain respect, on the one hand, it might appear to diminish the resources for investment. But on the other hand, what does the increase in wages also do? If not to that particular owner of capital, but to the market in general? Consumption will go up. Yeah, it increases consumption. So, to some degree, it increases demand, allowing for further investment. Now, that may not be true with regard to the individual owner of the enterprise, right? The individual owner may find his or her or their profit margins diminished if they're compelled to agree to higher wage rates. But those higher wage rates will produce a larger consumption fund, or a larger effectual demand, which will allow other producers, maybe even that enterprise itself, to increase its, well, to be able to sell more of its items. Well, there, in a certain sense, is an opposing interest, at least with regard to the individual enterprise owner and the employee. And Smith indicates that, in a sense, this opens up room for a struggle. Now, when we speak about struggle, you might ask, well, what are we talking about here? Is it just a matter of an individual bargaining situation, where the individual wage earner, shall we say, bargains with the employer? Or is more involved here? How does Smith characterize the situation? And he focuses attention on ways in which the respective sides can attempt to act in consort, as a way of, in a sense, trying to, well, bring as much influence as they can to bear to get the other side to give them an agreement they consider to be favorable. Right? So that the employees can get together and offer a common front, and, you know, in common, demand certain wage rates, certain conditions of work. On the other hand, the employers can do the same. Because in a certain respect, what, in a sense, competitive situation faces the respective participants that they have to contend with in regard to any such bargain? Well, I mean, to some degree, the employer has to compete for labor. In what sense? Your 
employers. Yeah, it's possible that the laborers or the employees will find another employer who will pay them more, have a more desirable uh, employment to offer. Right? So in a certain sense, making use of those competitive possibilities to, in a way, increase one's position. After all, the employers can do the same thing. Right? They can refuse to pay you what you want because they can find someone else to accept uh, the job at a lower wage rate. Based upon other employees who are out there trying to uh, find an employment. So to some degree, in order to prevent the workings of, in a sense, competition, for employment, for labor, to restrict the prices at which one can, can sell one's labor power or the, or the price that one will pay for labor as an employer, the two respective sides will attempt to act in consort with other individuals with the same economic function. And in that respect, attempt to well, you can say constrain competition. Right. Now, why is it that Smith feels that the employers have the upper hand in this entire situation? Because that's what he argues. Yeah, in other words, uh, employers can hold out longer in avoiding coming to an agreement than the laborers can. Why, why would that be the case? And isn't it true that the employers are ultimately dependent on the workforce? But why, why does Smith feel that they can hold out longer? Well, they have capital which can provide for subsistence for federal investment. Yeah, now, I mean, they have, they have capital that goes beyond a mere subsistence. Whereas the employees, by and large, you know, have a salary that they more or less are making use of for subsistence, and if they don't continue working, they're not going to get the income they need to survive. I mean, for example, this country, 15, I just read in the newspaper, that 15% of the population is considered uh, living in poverty, which is higher than it's been for, for a considerable time. But you can also think about asset poverty, which comprises the following. Uh, you're considered to be asset poor if the financial resources you have will last no longer than three months if you lose your employment or lose your revenue. And the proportion of the population, this population that's asset poor, is about 27%. <coughs> well, generally speaking, you know, Smith wants to argue, in effect, obviously, that uh, the employees, given their situation, given what puts them in the economic role they are, are relatively asset poor compared to their employers, which puts them in a weaker position. Now, he also brings in other things that could be considered extraneous to the economic dynamic itself, namely that the laws happen to be laws that favor uh, the consorting of employers with one another in sort of organizing what kind of uh, uh, wages they're going to offer, vis-a-vis -vis laws that, in some respect, hinder the organizations of labor to, to engage in union activities and the like. But obviously, that's something extraneous to the workings of the economy. If you want to think about the economic dynamic itself and what is necessarily mandated by it, uh, Smith wants to argue there seems to be a kind of advantage here. He points out, however, that if you want to think about wage rates, there's not going to be any automatic correlation between the general wealth of society and wage levels. Which is a rather significant point because it says something about the connection between the wealth of the nations, that is the wealth of the nation, and the welfare of its members. Because if, if, if there is no correlation between the amount of wealth the nation has in absolute terms, 
and the wagers. And it's not clear that the wealthier nation will, in a sense, be benefiting uh, its members. But Smith draws a contrast between, for example, wage rates and the, well, I guess the colonies still at that time, in North America, and, um, and Britain. And it turns out the wage rates are much higher in North America than England, although England is by far the richest nation in the world. <coughs> What's the explanation for this? Whereas there's no comparison between the amount of wealth in the New World uh, and that to be found in England in the developing factories. What, what's, what's the explanation of this? As to why, in a sense, living standards are considerably higher in North America. Which does not mean that, there's, that North America has more wealth. Well, he points out that what makes the difference is the rate of increase of economic development. It's the rate of increase that is going to drive wages higher. Why? Why would that be? Why? Well, it will mean, in a sense, that there's going to be, presumably, if, if in a way production is increasing rapidly, there's going to be a growing demand for labor that presumably will outpace the supply and thereby put competitive pressure to be favorable to employees to enable them to increase their wages. Well, I think it's interesting to reflect on all of these things because in a way, one of the basic underlying thoughts that Smith is presenting is that the workings of competition when they operate as freely as possible with no external impediments, that this is going to be a situation which will, in effect, allow supply and demand to meet each other as easily as possible. <coughs> and in this respect, will provide not only for, in a certain respect, the greatest increase of wealth for the nation, but will also be to the benefit of the individuals of the nation. And for this reason, any external intervention that in some respect allows products and services to be ordered independently of market prices is going to be something that will be antithetical to the welfare of, uh, of society. Now, admittedly, we see that Smith himself recognizes that the very workings of, of, of competition are such that there is a continual movement to and from the meeting of equalization of supply and demand. The very forces that lead producers to shift their production into areas where there's more supply and to remove it from other areas in which is oversupply will lead once again, to an oversupply that has to be brought back to, in a sense, the medium. And this is, in a sense, a continual aspect of economic activity. So in a certain sense, there is always going to be discrepancies and a move to overcome the discrepancies between supply and demand. Now, in the long run, Smith will argue that, well, for maintaining that, the situation that allows this process to operate without impediment is one that will best ensure that effectual demand will find the supply it is aiming for and that what is produced will, in a sense, uh, fit uh, effectual demand. And this, in a sense, carries with it the notion that all resources will be, be made use of. That all available labor will be employed. That all available capital will be put to use. That all available land for rent will be made use of. Or at least the optimal amount of this. Now, that does not alter the fact that individuals may find themselves in a situation where what they have to offer has no buyer. And equally, that those 
we need to buy something in order to carry on a certain line of production or whatever, can't find the resources that they need until things get equalized. Now, as Levine points out, and as we see Smith himself point out, the fact that individuals find themselves in this predicament, and indeed might be said to always run the risk of being in a predicament where what they have to put in the market is not something that buyers want, nor can they find necessarily what they want to buy. That relative, shall we say, deprivation is not regarded by Smith as, as problematic, because what does it itself do that in a way is a necessary element in the whole process? What does in a sense, falling into these deprived circumstances do that, in a way, is, 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 is basic to the very options, operation of the market that, in a way, could be said to invite the, the, the problem. <coughs> what put people under pressure to right, go where they can find employment, change their line of enterprise? come up with something else, etc. Right? In other words, to bend to the forces of supply and demand. Because they need to bend to those forces. It's not as if it's, a, if it's just a, a kind of option one's going to pursue for a lark. There are costs to pay if one cannot adapt, <coughs> if one refrains from adapting. Now, we've seen that there are, in a way, a whole slew of factors that are built into the operations of private enterprise that Smith presents them that restrain the so-called free workings of the market and the kind of equalization of the problem. So there are problems regarding knowledge of where and, and when economic opportunities are to be found, right? The questions of secrecy and so forth. There are problems of monopolization. There are problems of barriers to entry. And I pointed out that fixed capital in general presents a problem because you can't just move what is fixed without costs, which you know, present problems in terms of equalizing things. <coughs> so in some respect, it might even appear that the very workings of the market left to themselves may hinder the kind of dynamic that Smith is putting forward. That, in other words, there might be a need for an extra market intervention to allow the market to do what Smith wants it to do. For example, what would be a kind of intervention we're all familiar with uh, that has as its purpose intervening upon the market from without? by intervention of government for the sake of freeing competition. <coughs> a bailout. A uh, government bailout. Well, you could say government bailouts and also as a monopoly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Trust busting and things of the sort. When we talk about government bailout, there's, there's a particular issue that I want us to just look at. Um, and that is um, something that Levine points out. Um, as a kind of situation that, for Smith, is completely off the radar. You know, he considers it something that really cannot occur, given the very workings of supply and demand, and, in a sense, the presumption that the workings of supply and demand, in a sense, make it such that, as Smith writes on page 268, in all countries where there is tolerable security, every man of common understanding will endeavor to employ whatever stock he can command in procuring either present enjoyment or future profit. A man, uh, here I quote Smith, a man must be perfectly crazy who, where there is tolerable security, does not employ all the stock which he commands whether it be his own or borrowed in some one or other of uh, the three ways in which we've seen stock can be employed. Okay. 
for circulating capital, for fixed capital, and what else? Private subsistence, right? These are the three ways that you can employ your stock. Well, Smith is saying there's no way in which anyone, at least who's not crazy, would not, in a sense, throw everything they have into the market in three ways as possible to do so. But Levine wants to point to a situation that modern history is very familiar with, right? It's a situation that seems to occur with a certain kind of regularity, even though there might have been thoughts that after the Great Depression, at least in our neck of the woods, the recurrence of the situation would somehow be a thing of the past due to a certain kind of public intervention. But in any event, it's a situation of market failure. And Levine characterizes this on page 40 in the following way. Now, if we're speaking about a general failure of the market, and we're not talking about a situation where an individual participant in the market finds him or herself unable to find employment, unable to find affordable factors of production to purchase so they can enter into any kind of enterprise or the like. No, here we're talking about a kind of general breakdown of market activity, which can be thought of in the following way. You know, here we have all the goods that people need, they're available, and yet they cannot be bought and sold. It's a familiar situation in the economic depression, right? Where the factories are there, where heaps of unsold products are available, there are people who need them, and yet people are not being employed because they're not being bought and sold. Well, you know, you have the productive capacity to produce what people want, but the productive capacity is not being used. You have the workers available to produce the goods that people need, but they're not employed. Capital and labor stand idle. Why do capital and labor stand idle? Why are they not being employed? Why are they not able to be put into use? Smith tells us anyone who's sane would put them into use, but they're not being used, not because of some outbreak of collective insanity, or is it an outbreak of collective insanity? What is the issue? Why? Why can't the capital investment be put into use in producing the commodities that people need? Why can't people be employed? What is the obstacle? Well, you don't have effectual demand in the hands of those who would purchase the products to be produced, and therefore those who have the capital stock are not going to employ it, because if they set into motion, they'll be expending their accumulated capital on a round of production that they're not going to be able to sell. They'll be, in a sense, throwing their resources down the drain. And yet, if they had put their capital into work, if they had laid out the funds to make investments in further rounds of production and employed people, doing so would generate demand, because the money that would be employed to their workforce would be spent on goods that are being produced, or that could now be produced and find buyers. They would also be buying means of production that would give revenues to the producers of production, who could then put their capital to use. The producers would all be making their revenue, and the profits, in a sense, that would justify their employment. But none of this happens. Why? Because there's inadequate demand. And why is there inadequate demand? Because the productive capacity is idle and not being used. And if workers are unemployed and they lack purchasing power, adequate to justify putting them to work. So here you have, in a sense, a kind of situation of a kind of impasse. 
where the market somehow cannot get out of its difficulty. Now the question is, is this impasse due to forces external to the market, they're screwing the market up, or is it possible for the operations of the market in and of themselves to lead to this kind of impasse? This obviously is, is, a, is a critical question with regard to to what degree the market system is to be regarded as a self-regulating system that will indeed succeed in regulating itself and thereby succeed in uh, being to the benefit of developed nations. Now again, another factor to keep in mind is something I mentioned earlier, namely that the very prerequisites for market self-regulation <clears throat> to function involves a given distribution of wealth, of ownership, of commodities. Now, obviously, that has an impact on what the participants can do in the marketplace. In other words, what commodity ownership you have in large measure, determines what economic opportunities you can take advantage of. And that means that the workings of the market may not alter the relative advantage or disadvantage you find yourself in on the basis of the given distribution of property and commodities. The market does not create that. Right? You've seen in a way that the whole division of labor uh, and that's specific to private enterprise depends upon certain kinds of distribution of property that are not simply the result of a prior form of, you know, division of labor. They seem to depend upon something else. And in fact, uh, even though uh, classical political economy and Marx will want to present the economy as being something that is largely self-regulating, as something that will develop on its own. If you think back on how Marx describes the original, the secret of original accumulation, he refers to you know, certain kinds of upheavals that he will then go on to document the history of how they occurred, which will in a sense be uh, yeah, it's a rather interesting historical discussion. It, it, it sort of discusses at length the kind of things that Halbrunner discusses in the chapter on the economic revolution and that uh, Koyani discusses. But there was very much a role, a central role played by political authority in transforming the nature of land ownership, in, in some respect, establishing, well, a cooperative peasantry who no longer had the means and resources to be individual producers, but had to go seek employment on the land. Right? These depended upon non-economic interventions to establish the conditions for, well, at least in large part, a, in some part, a self-regulated market system. Now, if we think about this um, way of, of, of thinking both about the economy as a self-regulating market system, and indeed, perhaps the reality of the economy. You know, this is something we, we also want to look at. To what degree the theory is adequately addressing the reality. Um, it clearly involves a disengaged sphere in which individuals uh, find themselves both free to and having to engage in economic activities on the basis of economic motivations. And to some degree, as, as, as Levine points out, and indeed as Smith would concur, this sort of presents a situation where economic matters have a, not only an independence, but a certain kind of primacy. Because in a way, they seem to have an order of their own and a development of their own that is not the product of any willful enactment, of any willful enactment by the collective action of political authority. It seems rather 
that politics is in a position of having to deal with a social dynamic that operates according to its own laws and principles. And that dynamic now creates a history very unlike the history that might previously have been thought of as being the history of the succession of regions and the battles of different states against one another. No, here we now have history becoming dominated or thought to be dominated by independent, autonomous social development. It's principally economic in form. Now, for Smith already, we saw an inklings of, of what role he thinks the state should play. Right? I mean, no one would be crazy enough to refrain from making use of all their economic resources, provided there was what, that in a sense, the state is needed to provide? Security. Security. And, and, and what, in a way, are the two sides of security that Smith attends to? There's there two directions of that security. The state, on the one hand, must protect the nation and its society from other nations. But then, on the other hand, it must uphold property entitlements, the property ownership of its own members, from death to the life. And then, of course, we see Schmidt also speaking about how, in a way, there is going to be a need for the government to provide certain common economic infrastructures that the market will not itself be able to provide. It won't be able to provide them because we're dealing with kind of infrastructure that is, is either too vast in scale or of such a character that it can't be engaged in profitably by independent enterprise owners. That's not to say that the government may not end up you know, building bridges and roads by employing private contractors, but it will have to rely upon its own resources and draws from taxation you know, to get the ball rolling on these sorts of things. Now, those are the activities to which the state is restricted. It's not going to be concerned with any further questions of welfare other than perhaps concerning itself with educating the population to the extent as to allow it to function economically. But that is, in a way, the kind of restricted state and that allows one to see one way of thinking about the term political economy. In a certain respect, Smith's theory is a theory of political economy because, in a way, the occupation to which the state is relegated is very much a matter of serving the freedom of the self-regulating market and providing the conditions that allow it to operate. And on that basis, to provide for a welfare of the members of the state, <coughs> that welfare is considered in terms of being able to satisfy effectual demand. Now, Marxist economics as a whole is going to, in many respects, share a very similar vision of the functioning of the markets, but in a way see the tendencies of the self-regulations of the market as involving a dynamic that operates differently from what Smith uh, paints it to do. And again, what will be a key in the understanding of, of Marxist economics is that the self-regulating market system, the disengaged economy, is dominated by a central polarity. And that polarity is that between the private ownership of enterprises and the wage laborers who are employed by them. Now, to some degree, we've already seen Smith uh, a, a theorizing that leads us to see that, in effect, the market tends in that very direction. But what the Marxist economic analysis will attempt to, to argue is that domination of, of the marketplace by private enterprise 
involves, in a sense, a partitioning of the individuals who participate in the market into two principal roles, that of owning capital on the one hand and that of being an employee of the owners of capital. And that the ensuing relationship that the workings of the market economy will involve will involve not a self-regulating system that will, in a sense, be to the benefit of the interests of all participants, but rather that there will be an opposition of interests. That in some respect, the very relations of the market will be principally to the benefit of the owners of the capital and not to the employees. Secondly, the Marxist economic theory will want to argue that these very conditions by which economic relationships become polarized will lead individuals in the marketplace to not only belong to different kinds of groups that are defined by the different kinds of economic function they perform, but that they will come to acquire interests that they consciously pursue as a group. Further, that although these interests are going to be economically defined, they are going to lead to political consequences. They will lead to particular political involvements. This, in a certain respect, will remain in tune with the way in which state and the economy are seen in the political economy. And that, in a way, the operations of the political domain will be regarded as being instrumental to interests that are economic in character. So that, again, the state will be a framework in which ends and pursuits and interests that are generated in economic activity get realized in a specifically political manner. But we want to see what is the argument that lies behind this and what it requires to make its case, what kind of difficulty may be involved. And I think we'll have to wait until next time to go into this. Thank you.